I'm about to head over to the Farmstead Meatsmith's Butcher Shop for day two of the Pig Butchery Workshop. And the thing that is so fun about this, to me, is that if we do it simply and we don't trim anything off, we achieve that scale of effortlessly delicious. Wow. It is so I like inspiring. That. It's I don't really know any meat recipes, you know. I, I have none written down. I never follow them. I process meat for a living and I have not one sausage recipe written down. Um, because I'm working with fresh, healthy pigs. Or or any livestock. I'm totally spoiled. I never deal with something that is not just beautiful, perfect, healthy animal. Because of that, my whole job is easy. I just have to be generous with the salt and ah. it'll taste good. Um, and I, I only know how to cook meat three ways, because really there are only three ways. I just braise, pan fry, and roast. And so when I come to butchery, the things that I'm thinking about is how I'm going to make this big, awkward looking anatomy, this carcass, fit my pot, my pan, and my oven. Certainly. And that's that's the end. That's the goal of this, the tea loss. Butchery is not an end in itself. It serves the kitchen. So if at the end of the day you don't remember the names of the cuts, it doesn't matter. <laughs> if you know how to cook it, if you cook it and it turns out delicious, delicious. then you butcher properly. I see. That's the point. So yeah. that's kind of the, how I learned butchery was through that. Through learning how to cook it first and then working backwards from the dinner table to the butcher block huh. and that um, is the proper context I think we lose uh, we lose a lot of efficiency a lot of meat to changing the goal from the dinner table to the deli case to the meat case right. pork as commodity is a different thing and that is a matter of learning how to trim exactly the right portion of meat to you can tell the difference between 20% trim and 80% trim, like ridiculous. And portioning, turning the big quadruped into cubes and cylinders, because those are portionable. Yeah. And you know that that much steak costs exactly this much and it will get you exactly this much profit. Um, all of which is, it really diminishes the counterintuitive price. to the cooking, huh? Yeah, it is, yeah. And it, it also simplifies all the cooking. The goal is to make everything on that pig pan friable or broilable. Just hmm. Blast it in a hot oven or yeah. fry it on a pan. So you coming from the restaurant side, cooking side, right? Yeah. The but there side. were portions there though, right? You had... In our restaurant, no. I was butchering everything and they would use it for the restaurant. And uh, you'll see it's, it, it simplifies things. It takes the authority out of the recipe and puts it into just basic ingenuity with the carcass itself hmm. and with a few like principles that you start out with one being there is no trim on the carcass hmm. there's nothing that is get this out of the way so we can get to the thing we really want there's none of that um, especially on a pig there's nothing that is not cannot be easily turned into something that's delicious um, and so where the rubber really meets the road for me is not knowing where to cut but why? Why are you going to cut right there? And if you know how to braise, pan fry, and roast, then you know why to cut. And so for me, just as we'll go, I'll use those terms over and over again, but braising for me is big pot, heavy lid, you know, wine or stock or water, some liquid of any kind, right. and a tough cut of meat, low and slow, you know, for several hours, kind of like crock pot. It's the application right. of moist heat. And then roasting is can be low and slow or hot and fast, you know. Dry. Exactly. The the key is that it's dry, like a leg of lamb or a roast chicken in an oven. It's dry heat. And then pan frying is direct heat. You know, you just browning both sides and some hot oil and just enough to cook it through. Um, but that's it. If you know how to do those, there's no part of the pig, including things like heads, ears, tails, and trotters, that is out of your uh, realm of expertise. If you know how to braise, pan, fry, and roast, you can cook every ounce just perfectly, deliciously. Mm -hmm. So to split these guys, we're just going to start this thing that we're going to do the whole time, which is just cut meat with a knife and bone with a saw. So anytime you encounter bone throughout the day, that's when you grab the saw. And as soon as you're through the bone, 
put saw down and go back to the knife. Because the saw shreds flesh. Um, and it doesn't look so pretty. And uh, prettiness is important. So I'm just going to score the skin here along the top and right down the center, right down to the skull. And then, you know, make sure you're kind of stretched out. And I hold on to an ear, and it's great to team up with this so a few people can stabilize. And then we'll just go all the way down. And just remember these saws cut on, on the push. And we'll split the whole head that way on both of these guys. So it's really the side of the face, from under the cheek, under the eye, right up to under the ear. This whole <laughs> big, beautiful, fatty triangle. And I'm gonna, I start by just trying to find the inside of the jaw, cut towards the jaw, and that'll kind of give me a guideline, something to follow. And we're gonna oh, right here. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. gonna skin the meat off of the jaw except for one muscle. And you'll start to see it right here. It's this yeah. one. Oh. That muscle. And that oh. there's jaw. Right. We wanna leave that right on the jaw. Is that part of the cheek? Yeah, it is the cheek. The it's, lower part. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. the masseter. It's the the actual yeah. muscle that moves the jaw. <laughs> and we'll leave that on the bone. And it kind of wants to separate there anyway. Now you can see it real good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it wants to separate there because there's a seam. And so right here, these right? are destined yeah, to be salted, cured, mm -hmm. and then, which, which will cure them, and then uh, hung. I think right Once right you come up to under the eyes uh -huh. and the ears, you just cut it free. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Oh. And there's our jowl. Hey. And then the only other thing to do with this is we're going to trim off flaps and um, and kind of this bloody surface up front because blood is highly perishable and curing is water management and so all that blood is is highly delicious water <laughs> to all bacteria so if we can remove a lot of this bloody surface here we will ensure more or less that things won't spoil when we come to carrying it. And this is also kind of aesthetic too because this is going to hang in the kitchen for several weeks. And so kind of just trimming it up and making it smooth is also part of this. And trimming flaps, this is going to, this is part of the curing recipe that we're going to follow all day. You know, little flaps like this will become way over salted long before something this thick it's fully cured. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So that's why we want to get rid of little flappies that would harbor too much salt, more than the thicker portions. And then the little flaps you save to go in the sausage? Yeah. yeah, so we yeah. can make, you know, except if there's like, yeah, happens there's to be some blood. really excessively bloody yeah. ugly bits, yeah. or hairy bits, which I don't think we'll have any. These all look very clean. We'll just make a pile of this right there. We're gonna take out the kidneys. So we can kind of scoop wow. the, the kidneys yeah. out of there and you can cut them free. Once you've got them free on the moist, supple side, you can kind of start with the tip of your knife like that. There's a little membrane. Like a silver skin cut. Yeah, and once you get that started, you can kind of finish it with your hands like that. And that whole thing will come off. Seam for this to remove the leaf fat 
I usually find it easiest to access right there. Gotcha. Yeah. And if you see a silver skin on the meat below it, mm. then you're in the right seam. Okay. Yep, that's the silver. And you just keep working it, and that whole sheet will come off as one leaf. You'll encounter a tough little membrane. Just looks like you have. Sometimes I can break that by hand, just like you're doing. Sometimes I have to get the knife in there. But it'll come back to about here. Okay. Yeah. How do you know what's a braised hand fryer roast is the more pertinent question than where to cut because that will guide that question. And uh, how do you know what to braise? Well, you got to braise stuff that's tough, right? Because it needs that prolonged period to break down the tough collagen and fascia that makes something chewy and hard to, to masticate and swallow. And so you can di discern which parts of the anatomy of the pig are tough, right? It's very basic. Shoulder, you can think of the way your dog runs. What muscles is he using? He's a quadruped too. He's using this up here to articulate the head, especially a pig when they're, you know, rooting. Using the front leg, the shoulder blade is in here. They're using this back muscle a lot, right? This is their uh, speed muscle. This is how they jump and, and race and accelerate. So these are both used all the time. They consequently are dark. They have lots of myoglobin in the flesh because of that constant use, because there's always blood in there. And so they are tough. These are tough muscles, meaning it's hard to chew. And then you go down here, you got this flat area. And you can really only kind of discern the function of this when you see a pig in full sprint, which is a glorious sight. But this is really flexible. You think of the accordion spine of a cheetah, you know, when it runs? This is stretching with every step, you know, right in here. It's expanding and contracting with every breath that the pig takes, because the lungs are right in here. So stretchy stuff is fat and collagen, which is tough to chew. So this is all tough. Tough, tough, tough. Up here along the spine, we have this long muscle, the back strap or the loin. And how often does a quadruped use that muscle? Four-legged animal. Almost never. Never. Unless they're pulling themselves erect and standing up. We use them all the time. That's why we have all of our back problems. <laughs> you feel, you know, you can feel yeah. yours. They're tough. Oh, yeah. They're almost always flexed just right. to hold you up. Mm. They're just a bridge from here to there on a quadruped. So they're never used. They're therefore very tender. Those happen to be the quarters. Shoulder, belly, leg, loin. <coughs> Those are what we call them. And again, they're not arbitrary. They're defining muscle by its function. 
because the meat is just skeletal muscle. That's what we're eating. The shoulder quarter, we'll see, is tough, and just as we cut into it, it's also very fatty. It's also white. So we've got tough and fatty, tough and fatty, tough and lean, tender and lean. And those are the most pertinent factors in choosing what to braise, pan, fry, and roast. That's what matters. If you know the fat content and you know the function, which means you know tough or tender, you know what to braise, pan, fry, or roast. That's it. I don't know anything else about butchery. That is the sum total of all of my meat cooking knowledge and uh, how to break down a carcass. Those are the only guiding principles that I use. Um, it's the notion that I love a braised hock in the milk. I love a slow roasted pork in the oven, or pork shoulder. So let those be your guiding principles as you cut, because that tells you why to cut in a certain spot. Um, Okay. Yeah. Right. Shoulder, loin, belly, leg. Okay. Yeah. Um, the neat thing about the fatty cuts is that you can't really burn them, especially on a pig like this. If you were to roast it dry in an oven, yeah, um, it's going to melt the fat and baste itself in its own fat. So you can take a shoulder, a Boston butt, and put it in there at 300 degrees for four hours, and then forget about it for two more hours and then come back and blast it for, at 450 for a half an hour. And it might even be blackened on the outside, but it will be spoonable on the inside. This is pulled pork. Right. And that right. fat enables that. If the first marker is end of sternum. <coughs> Find the sternum. Mm -hmm. And if I go to the end of that, that mm -hmm. lines me up in between some ribs. Right, right there. Right. Right. And then that, those ribs in turn line me up in a disc. So if you look at the spine real quick, you can see we've got vertebrae, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those little lines separating the vertebrae are the discs. Mm -hmm. okay. And you can cut halfway into the spine. Now what's stopping my knife is just a little pinky of bone that's holding this vertebra to that vertebra. Mm -hmm. And so the rest though, along the line that is I that described... Is that feather bone that you call it or not? There's no feather okay. bones on... Yeah, this is. Yeah, yeah that's a feather bone. Okay. That's yeah. Um, the rest of what's holding the shoulder to the loin and the belly is meat. Hmm. There's no other bone besides that little pinky of bone. So that means I can do the whole quartering just with my knife. So if you just come through and do long drawing strokes all the way to the cutting board, come in and meet up here so that all the meat is cut in a nice straight line, then you can just lift this and, and it will... Off. Yeah, it'll and pull... It'll snap that off. Off. Exactly. It'll pull one vertebra away from the other. We can line up the, the saw right in that disc, and you'll go through it really quick. As soon as you're through, pull up with the saw and finish with the knife. from there in the direction of the head and that will put you just beyond the pelvis which ends like right here so this is the target ah, from that okay. crook in the spine it's one vertebra right. in the direction of the head okay. and again identical on all wow. quadrupeds see identical wow. marker end of the sternum that vertebra ah. but you can see from this yeah. if we follow that straight, straight our belly goes behind it right. so if you start here and just kind of follow that contour of the yeah. leg until you've got it yeah. Away. To the far then, side of it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you can continue.
So this looks familiar, right? Yeah. Chop Town. That's yeah, pork right. chop. Yeah, and pork what's chop. that? Bacon. Oh, yeah. Bacon. <laughs> yeah. There's pork chop. There's bacon. Yeah. So you can see. I I just say, well, what looks like a good chop? Yeah, it does. I'll make a mark on top. Right. Up there on the skin. That looks right. like a good chop, right? Yep. And then I go to the other side. I can see, well, there's the loin, oh, yeah. and there's where the bacon begins. Right. But I'm going to give it about an inch, you know, a little wiggle room, and I'll make another mark up on top. Right. So that when I rest it with the spine flat, so right. not like this, but flat, right. I can connect the dots. You know, all right. Now I'll just score the skin like that to connect with the other mark that we made. Right. Yeah. Now you just go all like the way through, you'll feel the ribs. Wow. Yeah, and cut. And then you'll have to saw each oh, rib individually to separate okay. this from that. And just make sure, as you're doing this, you can see the ribs curve right there. Yeah. You don't want to saw this way. Oh, yeah, you want to saw this way. Exactly. So right. your angle's going to be kind of like that. Right? Mark the top, <laughs> oh, and then lay it down. No, I'm just cutting off, then I'll. Yeah, and then just kind of score the skin to give yourself a, a reference point right. there. And then on the other side. Yeah, I give so myself about, about an inch. There. Yeah, right there. Yeah, and then you can there, just kind of connect the dots. And the main thing you can see is to keep your angle yeah, here, angle. Mm -hmm. not going down behind yeah, the rail. Yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So like, like that. that. Yeah. Yeah, that looks great. Now just knife all the way through here. Yeah, and then you'll hit ribs and you'll feel the ribs with your knife, mm -hmm. and then you'll be able to saw a rib at a time. Try not to even lift it up, because that pulls meat into the knife. Mm -hmm. But if I can kind of just scrape them, and it looks like they end right here, right? But they don't. Wow! Oh, they you end did right it. there. They end an inch or two under. Huh? Yeah. So as you're going through, you know, don't come up until about this line, and then you'll just have this nice, you know, very f thin mm -hmm. rack of spare ribs, which is still well worth barbecuing, even though it's mostly just the meat in between. top dimension is started, I kind of pinch my thumb and you can kind of just start freeing up the whole thing. Hmm. And it's just, it'll so take some milk. No, yeah, it's not knife work, it's just all back. Yeah, hand. we're all going to bring the whole thing by hand like this. And this I'm still cutting the shoulder off, third, fourth row. Oh yeah, right, I'll show you where to make that cut. Yeah, just keep going okay. and this whole thing right. will come off. physiology of the pig decide how thick these chops will be. And the key to making good chops is to chop them, to chop them <laughs> on a chopping block with a chopping <laughs> tool. If you try to do this on a balancing table, you'll hate your life. That's why these do weigh 200 pounds. 
it absorbs all, all of it. There's no bounce. So you don't have to use all your power and swing. Because when you do that, you miss. As long as you're letting it drop and you're not powering it, you, you won't miss. You'll hit the same spot every time. Is that a pretty heavy cleaver? Yeah, that's the other key. Cleaver has to be at least two pounds. Wow. A light cleaver is just dangerous, you know? You have to like wind up and, <laughs> you know, and you're gonna, like I got a little one up there. Uh -huh. Totally useless. I don't even know what you'd use that thing for. Cracking. It works pretty good as like a chopper, you know, a vegetables, like a little chef's knife. Quail. Yeah. <laughs> Songbirds. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Finches. Um, so you can see we've got ribs, and then the ribs end, and this is kind of, on a beef they call this the short loin. This is where T-bones would come from, but it's all that long, tender muscle that you cook hot and fast, which is really what matters. So a little bit of technique. We want to cut the chops, not so that they're all of even thickness, because that doesn't really matter, but so that the chop, one chop doesn't uh, have a thin part and then a thick part. We want the chops to be uniform. even, I wouldn't know how uniform. To do. We can't just cut through the ribs because we're doing this with a knife and a cleaver. And you can sort of see, this one's a little different, but they, they lean. Yeah, the, yeah, lib, yeah. the ribs aren't at a perfect right angle to the surface of the table or the spine. And so I'm going to start, the first one's always a little funky and I'll be in between the ribs. My main, the main thing I'm focusing on though is making my cut down this end parallel with the previous one. Because oh. that's what gives us an equidistant chop. So, yeah, these are almost vertical, so this is actually going to be much easier. Yep. But this one does start to lean a little oh, bit, yeah. and so yep. does that yep. one. So especially when you get to these, the key is you have to start right up against the top. I'll come to you. Yeah. So if you started just in the middle, yeah, if I go straight down, I'm going to hit the next one. Yeah. And it's going to do that to my knife, and that's where you get a chop that goes like that, you know, in dimension, which is not desirable. But really, that, you know, just start here so you know you're going to miss the ribs, but then the main thing you pay attention to is this line. Yeah. Because that is where you're deciding that, you're determining the width the of the bottom, chop, yeah. and you need it to be consistent. You know, I'm making my next cut parallel with the previous one. And then when you come to cleaving, use the heel, heel of the cleaver. And I kind of try to pull all the meat out of the way. And then just let it fall. And even if it takes a few, you know, blows, you won't miss. Because oh, you're just, you're just yeah, letting you're it fall. Letting it out yeah. strip, yeah. You're not oh, powering it through. Really Aren't they sweet? Yes. Yeah, so as you go, you know, just make sure your new cut Eventually you're going to be right up against, right up against these ribs and then straight down but parallel with your previous line. That, that's the key. This is the back leg of a pig. So for prosciutto purposes, you know, sometimes they just cut the tail off and the spine, they leave the pelvis in and that goes on the salt. Sometimes they, and you know, including leaving the trotter on. That's the jamón ibérico, that's the northern Spanish ham. Uh, the serrano ham is just this muscle. They take all the bones out, they take the hock out, and they even pull the femur out. They tunnel bone. Oh, no out. kidding. Oh, wow. Wow. So that once it's cured, you can run it along a meat slicer right. and you get right. long, thin pieces. Now, if we're just going to do this as a nice leg, uh, fresh cuts, even though we're still going to brine the hams in a liquid brine, uh, we'll take the trotter, the hock. This is kind of the ham proper. This lean bit, and then this is all the sirloin, the pelvis area. Down here, oh, I don't know, it's about right here. If you just go at it with the knife, kind of circumcising it, which is the proper word, uh, and apply pressure. See how I'm open a joint there? Oh, wow. Barely see that joint. Yeah. Amazing. You can't really see it from the yeah. skin side, yeah. but it's like, I don't know, what is that, two and a half inches yeah. from the back elbow, you know? Yeah. So somewhere right there. And oh. it's really the more pressure you put on it, you can see it. you'll start and you know just nick it. Yeah. So that'll come off just yeah. with the knife. And then when you come up here, I personally like to saw this one. We could do the joint, mm. but if we saw it, we open up the bone which has marrow in it. Mm. And since we're gonna braise the hock anyway, right? Because it's tough. Gotcha. All that marrow will contribute flavor to the cooking mm. li liquor. So 
knife down to bone, saw through bone, okay. knife through cutting board. Okay. And then up here we've got this femur, mm -hmm. or the H bone in butchery lingo. And I go just about an inch I'm behind it, me. parallel with this cut, okay. right here. And it's just going to be one oh, of these right guys. Here. And that's that? knife all this the way down to femur, one. saw through femur, Finish. knife, yeah. That's where he's Sirloin, leg, hock, trot. Cool. On this that's how we'll break that up. Oh, okay. Just meet all the way down. Got so it. you can just split them up into two picking shoulders. Mm -hmm.